Good evening, good evening, good evening, Facebook. We just want to say God bless you and welcome to this Wednesday night uh, discussion panel. We usually have a Bible study, uh, but tonight we wanted to do something a little bit different and uh, speak on a topic that uh, many people know about, um, but it's sometimes difficult to accomplish. Uh, and tonight's topic is evangelism and apologetics. And what is apologetics? It is defending the faith as simply as I can say it. Um, but before we get into questions, let's open up in prayer. I have a couple announcements afterwards, and then we're going to introduce our panelists. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come before you, we honor you, we bless you, and we thank you, God. And uh, Lord, as uh, we discuss today on this topic of evangelism and apologetics, uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, just come and, and uh, guide our discussion, Lord Father, that you would use these gentlemen, Lord Father, to encourage uh, to challenge, to uplift, Lord Father, that, uh, that as they speak, Lord Father, here, as they conversate uh, with one another, Lord Father, your Holy Spirit would minister to those that are listening out on Facebook, God, that, that, Lord Father, we would even learn from each other, Lord, as we speak. Lord, we just thank you for your promises. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. And at the same time, I just thank you, Lord Father, that you are even in the homes of those listening now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Before we introduce our panelists, I just want to have, I got a couple quick announcements. Um, uh, if you need prayer, uh, our prayer line is open 24-7. Uh, Feel free to call us at 585-621-1559. You can leave a message on our off, off, office hours, or you can even pr uh, call us and one of the pastors here at the church We'll pray with you. That number again, it's 585-621-1559. You may also email us at prayer at hcfministry.org. That's prayer at hcfministry.org. Uh, one more announcement here in this, this same topic of prayer. This coming Saturday, uh, United Prayer, Prayer for Our City over at uh, downtown Liberty Pole Way. Uh, that's going to be at 8 a.m., if you have time, come out and pray with the city. Uh, there's going to be multiple churches there coming together to pray for what's going on in our uh, nation right now. So just come out and pray. Amen. So I am Luis Diaz, your moderator for tonight, um, associate pastor of Hope, Hope Christian Fellowship. And I'm going to start to my left, all the way left, and we'll have these guys introduce themselves and their ministries. Domenico Denisi, Rescue and Revive Ministries. Julio Negron. We'll wake them up, and also uh, at, here at Hope Christian Fellowship, I serve as leading our church in evangelism. Paul Sutliff, author and uh, apologist. My name is Russ. I'm from the Father's Heart Ministry here in the city of Rochester. Amen. So we're going to get right into the questions here, and uh, let, me, let me say this. If you got questions out there on Facebook, feel free to send them in. We'll take them in. Just make sure you put them in the comment section. I'll ask our panelists. So, my brothers, how would you define biblical evangelism? How would you define, in your own words, biblical evangelism or even using Scripture? Who would like to jump on that? I believe it's uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Short answer for me. <laughs> short, <laughs> short answer. Amen. Praise Jesus the Lord. Yeah, it is. It's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Anybody else, though, how, how would you nuance it? From my perspective, um, I like second, sorry, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be mm. ready always to give an answer to every man. Hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen, amen. That's good. Um, there's hope in all of us, um, and people need to hear it. Now, we, that's if they see it, but there's also forms of evangelism where you go out and uh, you're out there doing what you do. Um, Domenico, you're out there doing many different things. What kind of drives you to go and do what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I was at the class here last night. I actually mentioned that because I was actually thinking about that yesterday. And I, to be very very candid with you, very honest with you. I, I believe it's just God in me. I believe it's a call of God in me because as I was thinking about it, and I'm sure each one of these men can relay a similar answer, is um, it's one of the minor prophets or major prophets that said it. I think it was Jeremiah. Um, he just said it was in his bones, and he couldn't keep shut. 
And then the Apostle Paul said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. I just, to me, if you really believe in heaven and hell and you believe people are actually going to be sent, their souls are going to be sent to hell because they rejected the true biblical gospel, to me, that's enough motivation. I don't know if everybody thinks that way. But for me, that's just something that's in me. That's what drives me is for people to hear this good news, this message of hope, as you mentioned, and uh, it's just something God puts in you. And everybody's called to do it. We know that. But um, it's always, I can say it's consistently in the forefront of my mind and my heart. Amen. Anybody want to follow up with what Domenico yeah, saying? something to that. Um, definitely, I agree with everything he just said. Uh, another key component for me is remembering where I was without Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a mess. I was a wreck. Mm-hmm. Um, once I seen, you know, I knew God was real, but I didn't want him. You know, once I've seen that man, that, and I really understood that God forgave me of every sin, that Jesus took my sin on the cross, that he made me right with himself, uh, that really, really drives me. That really empowers me to want to share my faith. You know, the gospel message, you know, for me, I reflect on it, and that gives me strength throughout my days, I would say. Amen, amen. That's, I like that because, uh, you know, the Lord uh, wants to use our lives. And one of the ways that the Lord uses our lives, folks, is that everything happens for a reason. And uh, I, as you were saying that, brother, I, I thought of that verse uh, in Second Corinthians chapter 1 where it says, and the God of all comfort will comfort us in all of our tribulations so that we might be a comfort to others. Uh, There's people, you know, uh, that are going through stuff, especially now. There's many people that are listening right now that that are going through major trials. There's fear. There's anxieties. There's addictions. There's struggles. And uh, evangelism to me is, you know, it's, it's what God has done in my life, and uh, he's working in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. And as he's working in me, he, and as Domenico said, you know, it's just in you. You know, it's, it's like a burning fire in you. And, 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 and everything that we go through, something that we may have gone through may be the very thing that God wants to use in somebody else's life because and bring comfort to them through you, a believer in Jesus Christ, to bring that, that, that the hope of the gospel to people. And, and, and as we started out, one of the things that uh, biblical evangelism is to me is, is, is uh, you know, being ready. Second uh, Timothy chapter 4, it says that you were to preach the word to be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, because it goes on to say, because there's going to be a day where they turn away and to fables and stories, and it's so important to me as a pastor over an inner city ministry to be able to preach the, the unadulterated, pure milk, the simplicity of the gospel on the streets of Rochester. Amen. It's simple. Amen. For me, um, I, I do a lot of the looking at what people believe and where Christ can, where, where we can work and, and get our, the message of Christ to them. And to me, looking at what other people believe is looking at the lack of hope. Uh, there's no hope outside of Christ. And that's the message, I think, that drives all of us. Amen. We have the hope of Christ and it's so sad when you meet people who just say no. And Amen. Amen. Well, let, let me say this, right? So we see in the New Testament, when we read it, and especially in the book of Acts, that evangelizing the gospel to those who'd never heard it brought about the power of the Spirit of God to transform hearts, right? That's why we, that's why we share our faith. Do you find that today... People don't believe that when they evangelize. 
Yeah, um, I, I think they, they don't. And I think I, I was even in the same uh, state at one point in my walk with Christ where for me, I wanted to speak the word of God. I wanted to speak the Bible. I wanted to talk about Christ, share Christ, share my testimony. And I wanted to see, boom, uh, instant, I want to accept Christ right now. I want him now. Like, you know, I wanted to see somebody change right away. Mm. Uh, but it came through, you know, I was let down a lot. Uh, although there were a very few times, just a few handful of times, where somebody actually, after I talked to them, they actually accepted Christ. And that was incredible. But, but the, the problem was I was looking for that every single time. Mm. And I think all of us could agree that that doesn't happen every single time uh, with you sharing your faith or talking to somebody about Christ. But then I started knowing my place, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, you know, Paul says that some of us were called to plant the seed, the word of God, and others were called to water that seed. And then it says that God gave the increase. God makes the seed grow, you know. So I started learning my place. I could just plant and water. God is the one who makes it grow. Amen. And uh, that gave me strength to, you know, share my faith more consistently. But I think definitely there's a big issue um, with, with people sharing their faith. Amen. And for, like, Domenico, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, have you found any issues with the church in the way they've evangelized? Well, I think with the church, if I look at the church as a, you know, as the body of Christ, as a living organism, I think what we sometimes look at is churches want to let's raise up people who are evangelists or let's get a mass evangelism movement going and they try to keep it within that infrastructure, that congregation. And it doesn't always necessarily work the best or we'll have some type of outreach. You know, Russ can tell you this. He's done this for years. You know, the Father's Heart. Russ has been to the Fall Festival when I, we used to do a Fall Festival in East Rochester. I mean, Russ has been part of these things. All of us have probably at some point in time. And those... Not that they're not good and they're not profitable, but a lot of times what ends up happening is it ends up being a Christian revival rather than an outreach to the lost. What I've noticed and what the Lord has shown me recently, more fruit, and in fact I have a piece of the fruit to the right of me, comes from equipping individuals and then allowing God to send them out. And here's a living example to my right in Julio. Uh. I've watched Julio. He took the evangelism course. He took Paul's course. He's been in the open door. He's been in the Father's heart. He's actually, I think, of a seed that's just grown. And it wasn't from him hearing a gospel message at an outreach. It was from him being equipped, God touching his heart, fanning his flame, and now he's out doing the work of an evangelist, independent but still part of a the home fellowship yeah. and able to work with other ministries as well. Amen, amen. Um, anybody want to follow up on that? Like, have you seen, have churches become a little bit, gimmicky in their outreach instead of just relying on the simplicity of the, of the gospel. We want, yeah, go ahead, Paul. I grew up in a very traditional church, and back in the 70s and 80s, evangelism was uh, for those traditional churches, and it still pretty much is a, a social welfare gimmick. Um, that's their concept of evangelism. It, it's not biblical. Uh, I'll say that. You, you can provide uh, you can do what, what Russ is doing is not the social welfare. I don't see you as doing that. I, I see you as providing essentials. There's a difference. And I see that's what a lot of churches have gone to. They've given up. They don't share Christ. They'll bring people to the country and not be allowed to, bring, to share Christ. There's a whole bunch going on where they're not sharing Christ. Mm. And that's, to me... It's sad. Uh, again, they're not providing the hope of Jesus Christ for them. Okay. Rush, you were going to go ahead. Um, I'd just like to say a word about that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, churches, right? Uh, they all have all sorts of food programs and things going on within the, within the church, and they're inviting people to come in and but if, if, if we as a body, as the body of Christ, if we, there's this thing out there, it's called the love gospel, okay? We just love the people, we, 
love, love, love. But if we don't love them enough to tell them the truth and yeah. bring the truth Amen. of the pure gospel and the word of God, then we're wasting our time. And that's one of the things that with the Father's Heart Ministry, uh, I believe that we're blessed. Our ministry is blessed. God's ministry is blessed because of one thing, and that's because uh, we want people to be saved, and we want the gospel, and we want the Amen. truth, and we want God's word, and we want the life-changing message of the gospel to go forth. Amen. 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 Can, can I say go one ahead. thing yeah. about that, that Russ said? Because when he talked about the love gospel, we talked about this last night, because last night was our apologetics portion of the evangelism course. And that was one of the ten doctrines. We didn't look at all ten, but that's one I wanted to look at. And what a lot of people don't realize with the love gospel is their idea of what love is is not biblical. Amen. And the recipe Amen. for biblical love is 1 Corinthians 13. Come on. And so last night we were talking about how to defend, you know, true biblical doctrines, not just refute a false one, but how to, um, you know, protect the true ones. So I thought it was very interesting. Most people that believe in the love gospel, it's, it's not God's love. It's not biblical love. Amen. Amen. So, so the reality is um, I think churches fall into the trap of trying to be innovative and to reach out to people. I don't think the intent is bad, but we, we, we move away from the simplicity of just sharing the truth. And in today, today's political correct world, we're afraid to speak about hell. We're afraid to teach people, at least share, share with them the consequences of sin. And I think sometimes that's, that's a struggle for the everyday common uh, 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 church believer. But l let, me, let me bring this out. We are in a day and age that is constantly, um, technology is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Are you guys in any way utilizing technology to help evangelize? Because it's important, right? It's a, it, it's a method, but we can stay to the truth of the gospel. I'll do this quick, and then I'll give it to the other guys. You know, the website, Rescue and Revive Ministries website, has been top-notch. You know, the people, the person that put it together. So we have our radio show, right? We have a YouTube channel. We have the podcasts that go up. Um, the Crusade has a Facebook page. And so it's a great question you brought up. I just want to say this. I was talking to somebody to make a point, and a friend of mine is one of the most organic, purest, churches I know of that I'm affiliated with, and it's not around this area, but they do zero technology, literally none. And it's a beautiful church, but I've thought about them these last 10 weeks as how are they operating? And so I just say that to say in 2020, to some degree, you have to utilize technology, yeah. and it certainly can be a powerful tool. You can use it in the right way. It's not good or evil. Yeah, it's yeah, how yeah. you use it, and it can be used powerfully to some degree at least um, for the sake of the gospel. Yeah, uh, for myself, uh, I was against using technology, me personally. Uh, but since, like, last year, I remember people telling me, hey, man, you should do a YouTube or you should, you know, post some stuff online or when you preach, put it online. And I just, I felt like I didn't have time. I felt like I was just busy with work, my family, doing ministry at church. Uh, but when COVID hit, that was the, that was it. You know, uh, I had to, as I prayed, you know, the Lord really put in my heart to do it, I believe. And um, started the YouTube channel, the Wake Em Up Ministry, and then uh, the Facebook page, the Wake Em Up, and uh, started sharing stuff. Started using my Facebook page. I, uh, I, honestly, I didn't like it, uh, using Facebook and stuff like that because there's a lot of negativity. But uh, then I just started to realize, you know, some people have put some, you know, things about Christ, some things, you know, with, with biblical significance. And I believe God wants to use me as an outlet also to be able to put that out also, biblical significance out in, uh, you know, the, the Internet. Um, I have a radio show. Uh, it's a news show. Uh, I, whenever I get a Christian, uh, it's, about, it's mostly about uh, Islamization and jihad that's happening around the world. I'm interviewing a gentleman tomorrow uh, who is a Christian, and I get to ask that show, question on my show. What brought you to Christ? What, what, what do you have to say to those people who are still in Islam? And I get to ask that on, on my show, which I love. Um, I, I've been blogging for about 10 years, uh, writing, but I think the videos are the thing now. Um, 
So the more videos you do, uh, I say keep them short. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Fifteen minutes and under. But other than yeah. that, yeah. I, I, we, and we're in the process. Uh, the Father's Heart Ministry is uh, we're revamping our whole website and our whole social media thing. Most of the stuff that I do, uh, it comes out on our Facebook page, our Twitter page, and I'm really starting to get new to Twitter and new to Instagram, but uh, those things are really key for our the Father's Heart Ministry. Number one, to get the word out about food and, and things. Uh, and before COVID, we would get the people to come, we'd set up, and we'd share the word of God with them. Uh, so, uh, our new website we're incorporating into our, going to be into our new website. We're going to have little blips in there, you know, uh, how, who is Jesus, you know, uh, what is born again, stuff like that, you know. Simple stuff, short and simple and, and, and to the point. And because my personal opinion right now, even though we're not able to gather as a church, I believe the gospel is going out more than it's ever gone Amen. out before Amen. in the history that. of man. Because you know, you don't, I can't tell you how many times I've been uh, on Facebook or posted stuff or done live stuff, and a day or two later, somebody shoots me an instant message and say, hey, you, you shared on Facebook, and, and uh, I gave my heart to Jesus last night, you know, Amen. so. Amen. All right, let me segue into apologetics, but let me say this. Uh, Pastor Tramfa, who is over in Spain right now watching us, uh, he said, uh, why not use WhatsApp for, evangel for evangelization and as a small group? So if you, if you don't know about that, check it out. Check out WhatsApp, and maybe you can figure out something new. Um, I use WhatsApp. Um, and, and so, but let me, let me just say to the audience, feel free to ask your questions. Like, hey, like the video, share it. Um, this way you can get out there. Um, but... Part of evangelism as well is apologetics. Um, and in our postmodern age, and this simply means this, so let me explain this for those who may be watching that uh, never heard this term before. It simply means that the ideas and values once held uh, by those having strong convictions are now questioned at every turn. And an example of this was how do you know the Bible is true? Uh, all truth is relative, meaning it's different for each person. Um, and this is kind of the mindset of the world today. How often in your time of evangelism have you come across that? Look, I'll say this. Again, telling the people the timing is good for that question. Last night, I say that apologetics is a conjoined twin of evangelism. Mm. Because with, you have to proclaim, but you also have to protect. So you're proclaiming the true gospel, but you're, you're also protecting it. Because if you're going to share your faith with people, they're going to come at you trying to debunk what you are telling them. And I'll just say one thing real, real quick. A personal testimony of that was when I had an opportunity to share with somebody, after explaining to them the true gospel and refuting some of the things that were false, they said, man, if I would have met you earlier, I'd probably be a Christian. That stuck out to me because I said, no, God's timing's perfect. But I understand what that person meant. And what I was trying to get through to the students last night is that you have to have some understanding of these different type of doctrines. Again, true biblical doctrines, and then how to refute the false ones. You don't have to be um, a quote-unquote capital A apologist, but you have to, what I like to call, have baseline apologetics. Amen. You want to jump on this, Paul? Um, I consider apologetics the evangelist toolbox. <laughs> that's like that's that. how I uh, build my course. The majority of what apologetics is, is it's it's ammunition for the, for the evangelist. Uh, ammunition. Well, it's knowledge. It helps you understand how to reach somebody. You know where, they're, where the downfalls are. You know things that people probably don't know about their own faiths. Um, I mean, simple, to me, that's simple things, and it's just knowledge. But without understanding the hope of Christ, it's worthless. Um, you don't without getting the doctrine behind you first, it's worthless. And that's, uh, again, it's, it's a, an evangelist toolbox. That's what apologetics so, is. So you're, you're nuanced in your apologetics. In other words, you have focused yourself, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you do more, but 
you've really focused and honed yourself in in dealing and rooting out the extremism of Islam. Um, have you come across any opposition in doing that? <laughs> I had one. Uh, I've had two, two, two things that happened that were really interesting. Um, in rooting out Islam and telling the truth about uh, terrorism and other things, I had uh, I was approached by my principal. I'm, I'm a special ed teacher by trade, and I retire in a few days. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> um, I was approached by my principal, who said somebody ac I had a, said I accused him of being a terrorist, and that happened to be the very day my second book came out. <laughs> so I thought it was quite humorous. Um, that particular day, the Muslim Brotherhood had labeled my book at 360 some odd dollars. <laughs> so I had to call the publisher and get the book back. But attacked, no, I'm, I'm of the opinion God gives you armor for your front. Come on. Uh, there's no armor on your back. That's the cool thing about this armor of God. He wants you to be wise and watch where you're going. Don't be foolish. I have, I have faith in this God of living hope. He's, he's so much promise that you can't even explain. I, I, I'm not scared. Um, and, and all I know is that I have to do what I have to do because that's what God gave me to do. Go ahead, Julio. I will say that, uh, you know, on a one-on-one on -one -on -one basis, you know, sharing your faith with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, people open up more. And so, with them opening up more, they're going to ask you questions, and they're really going to put out your beliefs. For example, it's easy for us to uh, preach at a pulpit or, you know, you know, right now if we wanted to preach, there's nobody going to oppose us. But if you try to preach outside or you speak to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, there will be more questions at you. Uh, so, you know, so we got to know, you really got to know the Word of God. Also, too, you, you got to know, you know, the questions that people are coming at you with. So, for example... Uh, a very common one is uh, a lot of people don't think that they're bad people. Everybody thinks they're good. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven. You know, everybody thinks they're not the, the murderer. Everybody thinks they're not the rapist. Everybody thinks they're not a racist. Uh, well, not everybody, but some. So we got to uh, be able to know through Scripture, the Bible teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, uh, we put sin in categories. Uh, and what I mean, we really those who are not in Christ, because those who are in Christ are supposed to know Scripture. So they put it like, you know, the lying, the stealing is very low. Um, the rapist, the murderer, that's like really high off the roof. And so, but in God's eye, all sin is sin. You know, and the breaking of his law, the breaking of his commandments, uh, it, it leaves everybody guilty to the fact that we, unfortunately, the scary truth, do we deserve hell? Yeah. But God doesn't want us to go there. That's why he gave us Jesus. And so we're able to lead that way with the gospel. Another one, too. Somebody will now say, well, look, I'm glad. This, listen, this has changed your life. I'm very happy for you. That's really good for you. You know, but me, I'm doing my own thing. I'm, you know, again, I'm doing pretty good in my life. And, and so they really just don't get it. They just think this is just one avenue. But I'm here, and we are here to proclaim, and Scripture proclaims, Jesus is the one true way to God. There is no other way. There is no other religion Amen. to be right with God. It's only through Jesus. You know, and Jesus is supposed to be for everybody. Or without Jesus, unfortunately, you, you won't go to heaven. You won't be right with God. You won't be forgiven. Uh, another one, too, is a lot of people are going to say, well, I am a Hindu. I am a Mormon. I am, a, you know, a Muslim. There, there's something else. Their, their belief system is completely rooted in something else. So, like, you know, this is where these two guys come in and knowing, and, and me, myself, I had to dig in and know, too, a little bit about other religions because, yeah, they'll mention something about Jesus, being in the Quran or Jesus being in their uh, belief system, but we then, when you uh, investigate and, and find out and read and study, you will see that he's not the same Jesus of the Bible. Amen. So we got to be able to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, but also not only is the Son of God, he is God in the flesh, and that Jesus that we believe in from Scripture is enough to make us right with God. Amen. Now, let me, let me you know? jump on what he's saying here. See, in the world... Um, kind of this movement that's, that's really taking hold is a uh, one, all religions kind of lead to the same God. And Ravi Zacharias, the world-renowned apologetics and evangelist who just recently passed away, uh, he said this in one of his books, um, Jesus Among Other Gods, 
truth by definition excludes. Truth by definition excludes. Who would like to just share their opinion on what that what they think of that? Go ahead. Someone, I don't know if you sent that the other day. I heard that just recently. It must have been you. Did you send that in an email, maybe? Yeah, it was in the email. I just said, <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, it's so true because, again, in Scripture and in the, in the New Testament specifically, but all throughout from Genesis to Revelation, you know, from the Gideon's 300 to the 70 that were sent out to the 12 that were sent out to the seven churches having a remnant in each, um, there's this principle of the many and the few. And the Christian is the few. It's not the many. So that truth although all-inclusive as far as being offered to all, it's exclusive as far as the condition. Yes. The condition is Christ, and Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many go that way. And that principle is sobering, but it's also ve very biblically accurate. Tertullian said, uh, truth like a wedge thrust out every heresy. It, truth is exclusive. There is no question about it. If you don't have the truth, what do you have? A lie. Uh, and you don't want to live like that. Unfortunately, many people are. And that's why in evangelism, our joy is to give them Christ. Our joy is to give them the hope of truth. That's right. um, you know, uh, as, a, as a believer, um, you know, truth was the thing that set me free. Come on. Come on. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says that no man could come to the Father but through him. Now, if you haven't experienced the truth, if you haven't experienced the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then truth can mean many different things. That's right. But when you truly are, are a person that has surrendered your life to the truth of what God says in his word, you become set free. And when you become set free, the truth of God, the, not just the truth of God's word, but the Holy Spirit and the, and, and the, the living God lives and dwells inside of you. And so that becomes truth as far, I mean, just taking a step back, back to like the uh, 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 apologetic thing, you don't ever want to get into an argument with people. I, that happens so much. Uh, and, you know, we have to remember that, uh, like Brother said here, you know, personally talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, the questions come up. Those are beautiful Things and you, you're more, more apt to be more effective as a believer in that area uh, rather than going. I've gotten in so many spats, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I blow it, blew it so many times talking to people and trying to convince them of the truth when we have to realize that it has to be a work of God's Holy Spirit. To touch that person. We are seed planters. That's, that's the thing that, I yeah. say from an apologetics point of view when I tell all my students. Our job is to be seed planters. It's, and it's, you, you've all said it. It's God's job to save. To save. We, we just pass the word out. We Amen. give them Jesus. That's all that we can do. Amen. You wanted to say yeah, something? something else. Um, also, too, I think, you know, it, it could be intimidating, you know, when it's your, uh, you know, family member or people that work with you at your job and uh, they have uh, different belief systems, you know, uh, they, they believe in something completely different other than Jesus Christ. And uh, again, uh, you asking questions, it's, it's a big, huge tool, you know. Uh, you know, look through the scriptures. Look at Jesus. He asked a lot of questions to his disciples. He asked a lot of questions to different people. Uh, Paul does too in scripture. But by you saying, you know, and that's a great starter, uh, you, know, do you, you know, what do you think happens when we die? That's my favorite. Uh, what do you think, you know, do you have a belief system? Do you believe in a God yeah. or anything? I mean to cut your butt, like on the notion of truth, though, right? So, yeah. so 
this is the thing. Christianity takes courage. Yeah. See, and, and can, you, can you share on if why people may be afraid because of the message? Because truth excludes. Yeah. And I think sometimes as, as believers who have never really maybe evangelized, we're, they're afraid to do it. So yeah. what are some reasons? I mean, how could you encourage them if they're afraid? Yeah. If, so if you're afraid, uh, you know, you got to really get into the Scripture, understand, you know, what Christ has done for you on the cross and why. And uh, also, too, uh, you know, you, you got to get over the, the, the way you get better at evangelize, evangelizing is by practicing it, you know, like anything else. Uh, the more you do it, I believe, the easier it becomes to talk to people. Uh, you'll get hit with different questions. There was a time where, you know, I didn't have, and I still sometimes don't have an answer to everything, but I've noticed that I've been growing and being able to uh, give out because I'll look up the answer or I'll speak to somebody that I trust to aim me to Scripture so I could be more prepared, and then now I'll, uh, I'll voice that out and I'll share that with the person. Anybody want to jump on like, yeah. this notion of, of, fe of fear? Absolutely, yeah. because Julio gave a good answer. But I'll say this, and Jim Tetlow, you know, uh, who Russ, Russ is, uh, you know, brother-in-law who passed, you know, he used to talk, he used to always say that for him the fear never way, went away. And I can tell you the same thing. It's kind of like this. Um, if you used to get nervous before a big game, it's the same principle. Amen. You know, it, it's like stepping out of the boat every time. You never, I can't think of many times, if any, where I was going to share my faith with somebody, whether that's to a crowd or to an individual, whether it's open proclamation or a private conversation, where there isn't some degree of hesitancy, fear, rapid heartbeat, something like that, because that's your humanity. But that's why I like to tell people that the Holy Spirit is the best evangelist. If, you could, if you've done, if you've prayed and you, and you get the word in you and you're seeking God, when you open your mouth, let the Lord, let the Holy Spirit take over, and he'll also take care of the results, and that fear will just start to wander. Amen, amen. I've actually seen a beautiful event where I took a teenager out. Oh, my, this is back in the 80s. <laughs> and we were downtown, and I was, we were passing out tracts, and he'd never done any evangelism, so I was encouraging him to hand out tracts. And he didn't really, he just needed some guidance. So I said, so we see this gentleman standing, you know, sitting there. Why don't you just go read him the track? So he does that. He goes there and he reads him the track. And the gentleman gets all excited. You know, I've been waiting for you all day. Oh. So he accepts Christ right there. And he, then he says, where should I go to church? And, and we tell him, that's up to you. Uh, we go to this particular church, but you can choose whatever. And he's you know, he couldn't, he couldn't, he was just so excited. And so as we start to walk away, another person sits there. And we hear, hey, you know what? I've been waiting for this message all day, and it just came. i got to share this. You never know what God will do with that little bit of seed you plant. <laughs> that was so exciting. Amen, amen, amen. You know what I thought of? I thought of... Uh... In Jeremiah chapter 1, where you're talking about a teenager, you know, I uh, just want to encourage you youth out there, you know, Jeremiah was a young kid, and uh, sometimes when you're talking to people, you know, you see their faces and you're like, afraid, you know. What did the Lord tell Jeremiah? He said, be not afraid of their faces. And Jeremiah came up with excuses, didn't he? He came up with, oh, Lord, I, I, I can't do this. You know, uh, you know I, I can't speak right. You know, I think of Moses and that. And, 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 and uh, the Lord said, be not afraid of their faces, for I'm going to give you the words to speak, Jeremiah. Amen. And God will speak through you. And I found this out. The times when I feel most fearful and most afraid, and I say, Lord, I'm not doing this because of my fear or because I'm afraid. I'm doing this because I love you out of a love and, 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 and you changing my life and being the Lord of my life. Lord, I, I, I just want to open up my mouth for you. 
And it's amazing. When you open up your mouth for the Lord, how God will impart to you the words will flow out of you like a river of living water. It's amazing. Amen. Amen. So, so on that right there, um, how have share a moment with the audience where out there doing what you're doing, where you've seen the hand of God in protection, provision, whatever. Just anybody want to share something? I got, Go ahead, I got brother. Something. Yeah. Uh, I was at Pinnacle Place Apartments, and we do this outreach inside for the Father's heart. And I was sharing the gospel, right? And there was, there was you, you never know who you're ministering to. There was a church group that came out with us, and there was about 15 of them. And I remember sharing the word of God. And I remember when I'm sharing the word of God, I, I let, and, and, and I share publicly a lot of times. I'm not, you know, I share one-on-one, I, but a lot of the times I'm, you know, sharing openly in the public with a crowd. And, and there was this one woman that came with the church group, right? And I began to share whatever it was that night uh, out of the Word of God, and, and I just felt God's anointing so thick there and so heavy in the, in the room, and the Lord was really using the words, His Word, and the words were flowing through me. And I remember just, as, as, and as you're preaching, and the preachers know what I'm talking about, when you're preaching to a crowd, you're kind of like looking around, and you're like, you're seeing like kind of like who's listening to you and who's focused on you and who's not. You can tell sometimes. And uh, I remember just looking over at this woman, and she just, as I'm giving an altar call, she just begins to weep and cry like a little baby and giving her heart to Jesus. Power. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most powerful thing on this earth. Amen. Amen. Who else? Uh, um, I remember, let me see, I think it was like two years ago, uh, it was on my heart, and uh, I call him Theo John, to uh, go out to evangelize, and we, we uh, God put on our heart Thurston, and it was just me and him, and it was like eight at, eight at night, and uh, we were obedient, and we went, and honestly, I, I never, you know, we never went there in groups or teams to evangelize, you know, uh, but we, we, you know, the Lord stole our heart, and we went. And I remember there were different uh, groups of people hanging on the different corners. And uh, what was incredible and amazing was that uh, they actually were, they were hearing us out. You know, and then one of the guys that was on the corner, he goes, hey, man, just be safe out here. You know, after I, I really witnessed to him, you know, and to me that's a blessing. When at any time that I'm able to speak to somebody and they're not, like, trying to leave right away or um, they're hearing me out, and what I'm saying about the, the gospel, you know, or answering their questions as a conversation going on, and I don't even know the person, uh, that's a blessing. But uh, being even at a, a, you know, a pretty rough neighborhood, you know, the Lord protecting uh, me, me and my uncle, that was great. That Amen. Was awesome. Amen. Who else? Uh, I, I'll share one because both of these gentlemen were uh, used, you know, testimonies of, of the, Russ mentioned it being the power source. And the reason you know, I named Rescue and Revive Ministries as I realized through sharing the gospel, both in group settings and individual settings in different places, the gospel's primary purpose is to rescue the lost. It saves. It's the power of God until salvation. But I'll just share with you a revival uh, testimony of the gospel. I remember we were on a, a missions trip. We were in Providence, Rhode Island, and I was standing across from Johnson and Wales College on a mic, hand mic, preaching, and there was this man um, across the street in his Johnson & Wales bus, and maybe he's even watching. His name's Aldo Ricaldi. Um, I'm Facebook friends with him, so Aldo, if you're watching, man, I'll never forget this. It was probably about six or seven years ago, literally, and I'm preaching, and I'm walking across the street, and I see him, and like Russ, he's just got tears flowing down his eyes, and I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? He's like, man, what you said, it's true. I just shook his hands and, and, and prayed with him. And I didn't see him again, but when I went back to Johnson, uh, Providence, Rhode Island next year, I actually looked for him. I got on a Johnson Wales, Wales bus looking for him because I told that man, I feel like the Lord told me, he, when are you going to start preaching? He's called you to preach. 
And I don't know if that's happened yet or not with Aldo, but him and I are at least Facebook friends. So that was just a testimony of revival because, yes, primarily the gospel saves. But so many people need personal revival by hearing the gospel message that's again. That's good. That's good. What about you, uh, Paul? I've, I've seen a lot of things. But my favorite scenario is the one I just shared. But uh, I think when I, when I think about people who are... I, I, like I say, I, mean, I do mostly seed planting. I, I look at Julio as, <laughs> I don't, I look at Julio as in some ways some of my success for my prayers. Uh, and that's seed planting. Uh, Julio was one of my students. And I can't tell you how excited it is for me to be here and have him up on the stage with us. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, I, I'm 55. I'm seen a lot of people make choices, but uh, it's the people that when you see the people find Christ, there is there's no greater joy than in being a part of helping them find their way. If you were just a seed planter, if you were just the one at, God called on you to pray for that person, I have a, I still remember as it in the, in the 90s, praying for a kid that I had gone to elementary school. One day, um, I was an usher in Bethel Full Gospel, and one day, this gentleman comes up to me and says, are you Paul Sutliff? And it was that person that God had told me to pray for over and over again. Amazing. And, and he had found Christ. So, yeah, it's where, to me, that it's following what you're asked to do. It's not always an easy thing. But it's the right thing. Amen. Amen. Uh, I remember, early, you know, when I was younger in the faith, uh, me and my father would go to, uh, uh, to the mall and hand out tracks, and they would kick us out every time. Um, but one thing I used to do on the tracks uh, back in the I used to put my personal number on there uh, just in case anybody wanted to talk. And um, I remember I got a phone call from a 15-year-old kid. Um, he was Ukrainian, and um, his parents went to a U Ukrainian Pentecostal church. And uh, he said, he said, you gave me this track, and the same night I watched a, a Christian video uh, on, on TV. It was a Christian station. He says, the track and what the person said just both ministered to me, and I just want to say thank you. I stood in touch with the kid, and, um, he, you know, from the last time I heard him, he was still going to church. Like, that was just powerful, powerful testimony that the, the Lord encouraged me with. All right, so l let me ask this. Well, we got about 13 minutes left. Um, I want to kind of finish off with two questions, right? There's a lot of people who consider themselves atheists today. Um, how have your interactions with these people been like? Um, I, I'd be honest with you, I think some of them say it, but they're not really true atheists. Um, they're just saying it because they don't know what they believe. Well, I'll just say this. I found with atheists, and, and it's very common, again, talking to the students last night, being the year 2020, we live in a post-Christian era. The vast majority of people who are 20-something, they've never heard the gospel. That's fact. I could tell you that experientially. They've never really heard the biblical gospel. I can't tell you how many people... I've shared the gospel with in a one-on-one -on -one setting very clearly and simply, and I've asked them, have you ever heard this before? And they've said, no. I said, you're you sure you've never heard what I just told you before? No. So I say that, so some of them are atheists um, because they've never had the opportunity to hear it. Other are atheists because uh, they've shunned it. I, I like to use creation, uh, Romans 1. You know, the visible things being proof of the invisible. Or I like to try to get a feel for where they're at. Do you believe in, in a higher power? What happens when you die? Those type of feeler questions or questions that open the door. And based upon how they respond, I kind of go to the next step. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? want? Yeah, I, I like uh, having conversations with atheists, uh, me personally. And again, I, I use questions. I hear what they got to say. And then uh, usually they hear me out too. So one of my questions is, uh, you know, do you believe, you know, uh, it took somebody to make your sneakers, your watch, your car, you know, and yeah, without a doubt, most of this stuff, it took machines, but people are the ones who programmed the machines at least. And they'll say, yes. I said, 
is it possible that we could gather a bunch of material together and then we could just blow it up and then it's going to become something? And they go, no. I had one guy tell me, yes, maybe. I said, come on, that's a miracle. <laughs> what are you talking about? But, uh, you know, um, in, in the same way, too, I, I like to use what, you know, a little bit of about what I know about the planet. You know how we're, we're rotating right now as I'm speaking, you know, and we're the perfect distance away from the sun. You know, if the earth was any closer, you know, we would, we would fry. You know, if we were any further away from the sun, uh, we would freeze. Yeah. You know, so it's like, man, we're placed perfectly. You know, and so I, I, what my point is, is I always, I'm aiming at a creator. I'm aiming at that there is a God, you know. And then, uh, you know, the beauty is they, they hear me out at least. And then what I do with that is I try to, if I had the time, to lead them to who God is. And him being Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Anybody else want to follow up? I, my, when I deal with um, non-believers or atheists, I like to find out what they really believe. And I think that's the job of the evangelist as well. To, and it's not just us asking questions to get there. It's helping them to find out what they really believe because a lot of times atheists or people of other faiths really don't know what they believe until you until sometimes they hear it said out of their own mouths it's it's a uh, you get those aha moments um you're asking questions like, and you're ta just like you're saying you do you really believe this um i think one of the f interesting points is like uh, i still remember my daughter getting in trouble in school um she had an atheist uh biology teacher and she would get in trouble every day the teacher would call this, call me at work, or, or my wife, then, my wife then, and um, she would say, well, "She's done it again. I've kicked her out of the classroom because she wouldn't stop asking this question." Okay, what was the question? I said. She said, "Well, I, the teacher says, well, I said we came, you know, came from an ape, and then the, your daughter says, well, what did that come from? And then what did that come from?" And what did that come from? I said, don't tell me. You actually said rock? You do know the difference between living and non-living material, right? <laughs> and, um, and my daughter was able to get her there multiple times. And um, it's, she got thrown out of the room for it, but she was standing for Christ. Um, I think you have to ask the questions, because sometimes people don't realize how ridiculous it is what they say what they're saying they believe. Um, it's, that's, I think that's the big point. Amen, amen. I think that, you know, um, you know, knowing God's word, right, knowing uh, spots, passages in the Bible where it talks about creation. In Psalms, it talks about the paths of the sea. I mean, Man is trying to keep is trying to keep catching up with God yeah. for centuries and centuries and centuries. But I think that if you have, if you can, uh, you tell them these things, right? As you pray and you say, Lord, it's not my job to minister to this person. It's the seed planters. Uh, you you just give them the information, okay? Anointed by God's Spirit, right? And then. You pray, Lord, stir up their thoughts and their mind because you give them, you walk away with giving them something to think about. You know what I mean? Hey, you know, even though they might not show it to you when you're talking to them, they might walk away from there and all these thoughts are, the Holy Spirit is working and bringing all, you know, wow, I, I never, you know, what if that's true? You know, uh, you know, we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? You know, I, now, I just want to put a plug in my brother-in-law, Jim, who I love dearly, and I, and I know my wife is probably watching right now, but one of the good things that my brother-in-law did, Jim Tetlow, is he came up with these little booklets, uh, 101 scientific facts in the Bible. Uh, 101 prophecies that are in the Bible. Short little booklet, you know, 
you know, sometimes just giving them something like that, if they're willing to take it and just read it. You know, it's not up to us. It's up to the Lord. Uh, you know, the, the Lord used the Bible track, a Jehovah Witness Bible track in my life to bring me to Christ. So nothing is impossible with God. Amen, amen. Um, I want to finish off with this, this last question. Um, how has COVID-19, how has uh, this current um, uh, uh, climate with the rioting and the looting um, due to the death of uh, George Floyd, how has this affected how you evangelize today? With us, with our ministry, because uh, right now the Father's Heart Ministry, uh, we're not able to gather the way we were. It's similar to the church, uh, but we are an essential part. So what we're doing is we're having a curbside pickup uh, every Saturday uh, morning from 11 to 1, uh, and we're doing approximately 300 hot meals and almost approximately 200 boxes of groceries to give out. Now, everything's changed. Everything has changed as far as how we do evangelism. Uh, really, I don't know how we're going to get back to, to, to normal, some sort of normalcy. I mean, we're setting up cones because we're having people walk up. It's drive up to pick up the food. Uh, and we, you open up your trunk of your car and we throw this stuff. But here's the good thing. The one thing that we've changed is the people that are coming in their cars, we have a prayer group that is out in the parking lot as the cars are lining up, and they're lining up in the parking lot, out the parking lot, down the street, and around the corner. I mean, we got 50 to 100 cars, 50 to 75 cars waiting in line to come through our drive through Then we got, uh, so we have a prayer team out there that is prayer, praying for every, we're being more, I think we're being more effective now, even though we don't like it. Sometimes we don't like the way things are going, and God says, well, maybe you don't like the way things are going, but this is how we're going to do it to reach people. Every single car, every person, is, I mean, I can't say that for a fact that we pray over every single person on our outreaches before COVID, but now every single person, every single car is getting a Bible track or some kind of literature about Jesus, and they're all being prayed over. And our, and our, our walk-up tables, because we get people that walk up, you can't avoid it, we're setting up cones uh, six feet apart, and they have to get by the cone, the next person by the cone. We have one person come up to the table. And so it has changed drastically, and I think that not only evangelism outreaches, evangelism has changed. It's the same message. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's still the same message. We're just doing it in a different way that's different. And it's me, I feel like, I feel like, you know, I'm used to getting out there, setting up and preaching the Word, man. And, and I'm in a different place now that I've never been Amen. as a ministry. So it's difficult, but you know, the Lord is still in control, and he's still uh, doing great things. Amen. Amen. How about you, Paul? I, I had an opportunity to work with Julio. Uh, we put together five different videos on Islam, and we're going to be, we're planning on doing more. So in some ways, this has given me another opportunity for evangelism. Amen. Amen. How about you, Julio? Man, yeah, and with those videos too, we're we're doing uh, uh, comparisons, parallels to Islam and Christianity, and we're looking to do that with other uh, religions as well. It's not to necessarily put them down, but it's to educate Christians and educate those who are are in those religions, you yeah. know, uh, to to see the truth, you know, because Christ sticks out. He sticks out, and, and you know, the Jesus of the Bible sticks out, uh, you know, big time, huge. So we're, we're just pointing that out. So because of the, the COVID effect, uh, you know, the, definitely for me it's been the online. And uh, also, uh, you know, it's been on my heart. You know, this is my personal thing. Um, uh, uh, you know, I've been passing out tracks. Uh, not as many people receive them like before, but believe it or not, people are still receptive. Uh, so for me, uh, because of my job, I'm downtown. And so for my lunch and my break, uh, it was my, my habit before COVID, I would pass out tracks. 
And uh, so I still continue doing that. Right now, I usually just leave them at the bus stops, and people take them. And then uh, sometimes I engage in some conversation, and I'm able to pass them out. But I'm looking to get up and running uh, even more uh, with doing that also with uh, evangelism. So, Amen. Too. Amen. Domenico, finish us off. Well, just a few quick things. Obviously, we had our first international trip to Kenya planned, myself and two other ministers, and we were supposed to leave Monday. Obviously, we had to postpone that. I don't think there's anything that hasn't affected COVID-19 to a certain extent. Uh, Monroe Avenue, our Monroe Avenue outreach, what we did, it, two things. In May, it was absolutely freezing, but more people came out to serve than everywhere. We had nine people come out um, to serve, and then what I was touched to do the first two outreaches for the first time ever is I've had people rotate for, through for 30 to 45 minutes, rotate through and pray out loud on the mic. And so I think that that's a work of the Spirit, similar to Russ, how they're praying over the cars. And ne we never did that last year, but this year I just felt touched. 30, 45 minutes, everybody's there. They're just rotating through and praying, public proclamation of prayer. And then the Crusades, we would have already had our first meeting. We have our first meeting Monday. We have 12 men going. That we're maxed. Still have the prayer team going. But the campuses, which we focus on, we're going to adjust it accordingly. If they're closed down, we'll take it to the marketplace. So to some degree, all ministry, like you've heard, has been affected. But as long as I have this phrase, improvise, adapt, and overcome. And that's one of my catchphrases that I always use. So that's what you have to do with the gospel, too, is improvise, adapt, and overcome. Never does the message change, but sometimes you've got to change where you deliver it, when you deliver it, so on and so forth. Amen, amen. All right, I just want to say uh, thank you to our viewers out there. Thank you to our panel guests coming up here and, and uh, sharing on this topic of evangelism, apologetics. Um, I appreciate all you, all the work that you guys do. May God continue to bless all that you touch and uh, all the people you speak to. Amen. Let's close in prayer and we'll move forward for the rest of our, our night. Father, we come before you, Lord, and uh, we thank you once again for this opportunity, Lord Jesus, to speak and discuss on this topic of evangelism, uh, speaking the gospel on your behalf to others, Lord, and uh, defending the faith as needed, Lord Jesus. God, right now for those uh, uh, listening, Lord Jesus, I pray, equip them, Lord Father, encourage them, uh, and give them boldness, Lord Father, to move in faith, to share their testimony, to hand out a tract, to speak the gospel message as they know it, Lord Father, because uh, people need to hear the message, Lord Father, and the reality is they may be the only preachers in their little world, Father. So I thank you, God. I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, as we leave here, we ask that your blessings may be upon us. Uh, for everyone listening, may your spirit be with them, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, church.